Welcome everyone. Today's webinar will begin shortly. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Um, we're so excited to team up with the Environmental and Energy Study Institute, the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association, and the U.S. Department of Agriculture for today's presentation on expanding clean energy and electrification opportunities in rural America. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Liz, um, and I'm going to run through just a few housekeeping items before we get started here. Um, so first off, today's webinar will run for 60 minutes um, and just note that your audio will be muted for the duration of that time. Um, however, we do want to hear from you. Um, so we encourage you to use um, to ask questions rather by typing them into the chat box throughout the webinar as they come up. Um, we will be monitoring that conversation and we'll do our best to get to as many of your questions as possible during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. So to get us started this afternoon, I'm going to hand things over to NCB Eclusa President and CEO, Doug O'Brien. Doug. Thank you, Liz. Uh, and uh, thank you, everyone, for taking the time today to be part of this, uh, I think, very timely and important conversation. Uh, I just want to, um, to make a few comments, and then I'm really excited to hear from uh, this great panel that we have today. Uh, first, just a, a, a quick moment on NCBA CLUSA, the National Cooperative Business Association. CLUSA International, we're the apex association for all kinds of cooperatives, uh, including rural electric cooperatives, ag cooperatives, housing cooperatives, working cooperatives, food co et cetera. Um, and our role is to uh, advocate, defend, and promote uh, the cooperative business model. Um, and we do that uh, in a number of ways. So we brought together today a, um, a great set of folks who have been working at kind of different angles around a, a terrifically important issue uh, and that's energy efficiency and and um, and uh, you know beneficial elect electrification in rural America. I'm sure most of you know on this uh, webinar today the the really storied history of um, rural electric cooperatives in the United States of America. In 1930, uh, 10 percent of the households in rural America had access to electricity, whereas about 90 percent of those in cities did. Uh, you know, in, in the early 1930s, the federal government created programs to, um, to motivate then investor-owned utilities to invest in infrastructure to get electricity out to those rural parts. And at that time, those investor-owned utilities didn't have any interest in that. It didn't pencil it out. But the farmers and the rural people, they understood cooperatives and they brought cooperatives together so that they could access and partner with those federal programs. Um, and the rural electric cooperatives today, uh, you know, now serve uh, nearly 20 million households, businesses, schools, uh, and communities in, in the vast majority of the United States. And these are entities that are owned and controlled uh, and benefit the people who use them because they are cooperatives. So today's discussion will focus on the different efforts to help people and communities in rural America through energy efficiency. We have some great success stories uh, compiled here worth you know uh, people to to know about as congress considers uh legislation that will affect certainly the energy infrastructure uh and at the end of the day the quality of life for people across the country and and in rural america now we've got a terrific set of speakers today including john michael cross from the environmental and energy study institute bob coates from the u.s department of agriculture and adora Efebi from the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association. Uh, before we kick off today's discussion, we did want to open with a very brief video that shares some stories of some of the beneficiaries of the Rural Energy Savings Program that was provided by the American Council for an Energy Efficiency, Energy Efficient Economy with support from EESI. So, uh, let's go ahead and run that video and then we'll get to hear from our panelists.
it's been a long time since my healing system been broken. It's been a long time. After my system went out, I never could get it fixed because it was just too much. I, I couldn't afford it. So I had to let it go, not to start getting to be some heaters for the winter. And for the summer, I get fans. And it wasn't doing anything but just running my light bill up, 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 up. Well, it ran my light bill up to more than five and six hundred dollars a month. So I'm on a fixed income. This light bill ain't got so out of hand. I'm worried that they're going to, you know, soon put me in the dark. A lot of the people that live in the rural areas homes have a tendency, I will say, to not be well insulated. They're losing energy through leaky ductwork or leaky windows, and they're paying for that. When you can't pay your power bill with one whole paycheck, you have a problem. And that's not counting you've got four kids and groceries and gas to get back to work. You know, when your power bill is $589, then that doesn't leave a whole lot of room for anything. I had to make some choices on whether to pay my high energy bill or cut back on my grocery bill or cut back, back on other necessities that I needed to have from day to day. I had to be very mindful about how much traveling I had to do because I had to be concerned about paying my electric bill. My husband had recently passed. I was a widow and a single parent and I was the only sole source income. I almost gave up and I actually almost walked away from the home. And once I got introduced to this program, I became hopeful. The program that we operate, the on bill financing program, can be a quick turnaround to not only get the problem fixed, but to get the member into a comfortable situation. When the co op sends us a bid sheet out, we come out and see what we got to do to fix the house. We come out and air seal them and uh, pack in holes if there's any. If they need a, another unit, we put a new unit in. We normally cut them down the light bills in half, especially if you're in a manufactured home that light bills are high. When you analyze my bills, there's at least a minimum of $250 a month in savings compared to what I was paying. I did not understand what being energy efficient was until they did this. I did not understand that I could save that much money if my house was energy efficient. I'm grateful for this program and I just hope that other people will be able to benefit from it because it really did change my life. Yes, it really did. And, well, thank you. Uh, some great examples there of what um, of what some of this uh, federal policy can mean for rural households. Um, so we're going to jump right into the conversation with the panelists. I will remind folks that if you have questions um, for the panelists, uh, please put them in the chat. We are monitoring those, and we'll have time for some questions at the end. Uh, but but now I want to hand it off, and you can turn your camera on, John Michael. Uh, John Michael Cross is the uh, director of um, of the Onbill financing uh, program at EESI, and and we've been able at NCBA Inclusive really enjoyed working with the EESI for these uh, past few years, and um, on on this work around the uh, rural energy uh, savings program, and just making sure that more rural people have uh, an ability to access these programs, partnering with USDA. So, uh, John Michael, thanks, Doug. Uh, it's great to be here today. Uh, I'm John Michael. Uh, this is Maple behind me. Uh, if uh, it goes like it normally does, she is not going to move the whole time. But in case a dog just pops up at some point, just want to let you know. Uh, hopefully, it will only be four-legged creatures that interrupt us. I can hear two-legged ones running around, uh, but you know, maybe the door closed will actually work this time. Uh, so uh, ESI, uh, we've been a proud partner with uh, NCBA CLUSA uh, for several years now on rural energy issues, uh, especially around improving access to homes and small businesses uh, to cost-saving energy upgrades. 
for those who don't know, uh, ESI, we're a 40-year-old nonprofit. Uh, we were spun out of a bipartisan congressional caucus to be an independent organization. Uh, and we continue to be an educational resource on energy environment, but <laughs> energy environmental policy development. Uh, but starting about a decade ago, uh, we began working directly with rural electric co-ops and other smaller utilities, uh, first in South Carolina, including Aiken Electric, that you, was just featured in the video, uh, to, assist them to assist them to develop accessible, inclusive, on-bill financing programs for their members. Uh, this work has grown into our Access Clean Energy Savings Project, uh, which I manage. One of the main goals with our project is to help reduce rural energy burden uh, for homes and small businesses that need it most. Uh, energy burden is the uh, percentage of a household's income spent on home energy bills, not water, not internet, not transportation, just home energy use. Uh, ACEEE, did the video, uh, put out a great report on this two years ago. Uh, they report found that nationally, pre-pandemic, uh, the average energy burden is about 3%. For rural households, that figure is closer to 4.5%, uh, uh, so nearly 50% higher than urban households. Low-income households, of course, have it worst, uh, with medium energy burden of, of 9%. Um, energy burdens of 15% or higher in, or even much higher, as it's on the video, uh, are pretty common for rural low-income households. And these are just annual averages. They don't account for potentially massive bill spikes in summer and winter. This, is, this bleeds household budgets. Uh, they're stretched thin already for, as you, as you heard, food, housing, other utilities, healthcare, you name it. Uh, High-need, high-use households might get lucky with some light heap assistance uh, or income qualified weatherization but many more are gonna go without. Uh, most utilities offer energy uh, efficiency incentives to their customers, uh, but these are more often than not rebate programs. And this ends up being a abuse to a fairly small slice of the households in the service territory, because rebates don't do you a lick of good if you don't have the means to cover the full cost up front. Uh, especially for a more comprehensive whole house efficiency upgrade that may well offer some of your biggest net savings. So this leads me to one of my main points, which is that co-op members and other consumers need different utility-led solutions to help them take advantage of cost-effective energy upgrades, particularly ones that promote equity and accessibility across the service territory and reach those underserved by traditional utility programs. And out in the field, particularly among a subset of co-ops, we're seeing a lot of success with inclusively designed on-bill financing programs. Now, on-bill is definitely not a new idea. By our count, there are at least 120 programs operating around the country, uh, some for as long as nearly 40 years. Uh, on-bill was even a tool used by REA 90 plus years ago uh, to help newly electrified rural homes to be able to finance their first set of electric appliances. At its core, on the financing is where financing payments are integrated into the existing utility bill. Utility might use their own funds, to help customers invest in upgrades and then recover that investment, or utility may act as a pass-through entity for a third-party lender. Now, besides convenience uh, to the parties involved, there is nothing inherently more accessible about on-bill programs than say another type of financing. And certainly, not all programs, not all programs are developed and implemented with the same uh, care as others. So we, we at EESI specialize in working with utilities on on-bill program designs that do expand accessibility. And co-ops have been at the forefront of building these better programs over the past decade. So some of these better program designs include the utility and the program participant working together to make a work plan that emphasizes cost effectiveness. And that includes keeping rates low and having longer repayment terms uh, to help ensure that the monthly average payment does not exceed the average monthly savings. And getting that bill neutrality or even cash flow positive is absolutely critical. Uh, and, then, and then pairing with that, you wanna make sure the program is following a robust quality control procedure that makes sure, uh, make sure that installed measures are installed and performing properly. Uh, we would like to see no upfront cost to participants to eliminate the pay to play barrier 
that so many efficiency programs have. And we like uh, we really emphasize using an alternative underwriting process to expand access, uh, most commonly by using good bill payment history instead of uh, credit score or income data. Now that might sound a little scary, uh, but when you pair that with some of the program design pieces I've already mentioned, this is shown to expand program accessibility without raising default rates. Uh, in fact, most programs we work with have a default rate of 1% or even less. So all this brings me to the Rural Energy Savings Program, or RESP. Uh, this is gonna segue into the next presentation from Bob. Uh, and uh, it's also a program that uh, helps out the Aiken program that we saw there at the beginning. Uh, we've been a big fan of RESP ever since it was first introduced as a bill in 2010. Uh, because it solves the main problem that nearly every co-op has when they start to consider an on-bill program, which is where they're going to get the money from, the capital from, uh, especially at a low enough cost that they can offer a good deal to their members. Now, Bob's going to go into a lot more detail, uh, but I just want to make a couple key points about it um, uh, before he takes over. Uh, one, you're going to see that RESP is seeing a lot of year-to-year -year growth, both in approved applications and project sizes. Uh, this has been aided by small bumps in appropriations, which has been great. Uh, but I want to stress this growth has happened with virtually no marketing at the national level from USDA. Uh, USDA went three years from March 2017 to April of last year without mentioning RESP in a press release once, uh, either to announce new application windows uh, or to celebrate completed loan awards. So I find that I'm routinely explaining to co-ops and other eligible entities that Unbeknownst to them, that one, there's this program is actively making awards and taking applications, and two, that REST capital is available for the exact things that they're seeking money for. Uh, there's just there's a big information gap. Now that can be easily resolved for an individual co-op if they pick up the, the phone and calls Bob. Bob will get them straight. But there are 900 electric co-ops, 1,500 rural public power utilities, and many other eligible entities. And most do not really understand what REST can do for them uh, and what it's already doing for similar utilities. Uh, USDA marketing, it's been a little bit better of late. And it, we anticipate that market is getting a big boost under this new administration. And I think that's gonna lead to a surge of interest in the program once more utilities understand uh, that this money's out there and what it's already doing. Uh, that includes that REST goes far beyond standard energy efficiency measures. Uh, uh, those though, though, that remains a terrific way to cut bills and improve quality of life. Uh, REST can provide 0% capital for cost-effective distributed generation, battery storage, fuel switching, full replacement manufactured homes, and a, a range of other stuff. Now, beneficial electrification has obviously become a big topic the last couple of years, uh, and electric co-ops are really embracing it. Beneficial education, by the way, is the use of electricity for end uses, whether that's building heat, transportation, or any other number of applications, uh, in a way that saves consumers money, reduces carbon emissions, and strengthens the grid. It was one of the big ideas that NRECA presented at their big annual meeting uh, one year ago. And here, with RESP, we have a program that is providing capital to co-ops for beneficial electrification financing programs. Uh, and uh, so my last thing is just for one quick example, and you'll, you'll hear more from Bob, but so Orca's Power and Light in Washington State has two RESP awards for a combined $20 million for its Switch It Up program. Uh, and this provides uh, on-bill financing to help members get off delivered heating fuels and move to efficient heat pumps for space and water heat. It also finances level two EV charging equipment and even wiring homes for fiber optic, fiber optic internet with the argument that a lot of today's energy efficiency products do not work properly without a broadband connection. Since launching two years ago, uh, Orcas, which is a co-op of just 14,000 meters, has invested over one and a half million dollars across 170 projects for its members. And that's, that's, that's reducing carbon, that's, that's uh, uh, saving its customers money, and it's, you know, it's great for Opaco's business on top of everything else. So uh, with that, I'm gonna stop there. Uh, you'll be in good hands with Bob as he goes into more detail. Uh, so thanks again for your time and for Doug and Kate and the rest of NCBA Clusa for having me today.
John Michael, thank you, and I and I do want to hand it off to Bob, who can who can kind of really get us into some details. I just have one quick question for you, John Michael, before we 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 kind of get into uh, to some of the the actual workings, you know, from the agency that's uh, implementing RASP. Um, and I want to go back to one of your earlier points, John Michael, and that is, um, you know, what what these strategies really mean for the families and households in rural places. And this is, this is always, I've always been a huge fan of RESP and, and similar programs uh, because at the end of the day, what it does is it increases discretionary income, which is always important for any family, but particularly important for families that have low income, right? And so, and, and you went in, John Michael, you know, the way sort of part of the magic potion here is, is this on bill financing? You know the 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 ability to actually finance these in a way that manages risk and brings a lot more people into uh, into the program. So I guess my my question, John Michael, is that and you've covered this, but I wanted to kind of get back to it a little bit. Is um, you know what what makes this the the, the sort of the on bill financing makes it possible for a lot more people as opposed to somebody just walking into their local bank and saying, hey, I need, you know, $2,500. Um, you know, what's what's the difference between those two things and why is on bill that much more effective? Yeah, I would say that one of the big differences between just going to your local bank is that uh, I, I think um, your average bank loan administrator doesn't understand the value of energy efficiency. Uh, mm -hmm. And so by tying that into the utility, it obviously does, um, uh, it's it's just a much better um, uh, a, a scenario for success, and they're, you're just skipping out that point where the homeowner has to, or the the, the uh, person trying to get the loan has to explain why they want to do this and like right. what, how it's going to save money. You know, in terms of how it benefits folks, I mean, we, we um, uh, these numbers are not precise at all, but one of the ways we tend to look at it is rebate programs where you need to have all your money kind of upfront and then get a nice little check in the back end. Let's say that is a workable solution for maybe the top 25% of your service territory at income levels. And say the bottom 25% is gonna be your most likely eligible for, for a LIHEAP quick fix or you know, uh, some, some uh, free weatherization that's gonna help them out in the longer term. And that's great. We, uh, let's keep giving away benefits to as many people as possible rather than having to pay for them. But you have this middle chunk, you know, 50%, 40%, you know, whatever it might be that is not being helped by either side uh, of mm. those of those programs. And so on bill, designed correctly, we think it's a, it's a really great way to serve that portion of the service territory. That makes a lot of sense. Thanks, John Michael. So let's go to Bob Coates. Bob, go ahead and turn your camera on. Uh, Bob is, uh, he's a branch chief of elect programs at USDA. Uh, Bob's been working with RESP uh, for some time now, and, and we're really glad to have you part of this conversation today, Bob. Um, so take it away. Great. Thanks, Doug, and thanks, John Michael, for the intro. So yeah, let's get started with the slide deck. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Um, let's talk a little bit about today, and I'm, there's a lot of slides. I wanted to provide as many as I could, because hopefully you have access to these slides uh, after this presentation is over um, and you'll have uh, an opportunity to uh, to get in touch with us if uh, if you have any questions but i want to talk to you a little bit about the rural utility service um, and the rus electric program which is the group that i'm part of and then we'll talk a bit, a bit about resp and then i want to give you some of those success stories that john michael has talked about next slide please okay so rus does make loan and loan guarantees in rural areas for follow for the following systems um, electric from 1935, water and wastewater, we actually started in 37, telephone in 1949, and broadband in 2002. Uh, we're a $245 billion loan portfolio at this point. Next slide, please. So the electric program itself makes loans and loan guarantees for electric power systems. We do for about 610 co-ops across the country. Um, and, and, and in 46 different states. And we also do relending for energy efficiency investments. We have two programs. One is the EECLP, Energy Efficiency and Conservation Load Program, which is part of our, our what we call our FFB program. 
and then we have one for rest, which is what we're going to talk about today. Next slide, please. So this is a RESP overview, and I don't want to go into it in great detail. This can be a 10-minute slide. But long story short, it is a relending program that's 0% lending from us to the eligible borrower, usually a co-op, for up to 20 years. And they have the ability to loan to what we call a qualified consumer at up to 5%. So you can make up to 5% on this deal for, or, or less uh, for up to 10 years. Next slide, please. So next slide. I shouldn't have put those transition slides in here, but the purpose of, the, of RESP is really to help rural families and small businesses, those small business by the SBA definition, achieve cost savings by providing loans to these qualified consumers through eligible entities, i.e. the co-ops, to implement cost-effective energy efficiency, energy storage, and renewable energy technologies, as John Michael was saying. Next slide, please. Uh, so who can be a rest borrower? It's um, everybody that we normally uh, would loan for the FFP program, public power districts, um, co-ops, et cetera, and those that are primarily owned or controlled by one of these co-ops or with this new um, regulation that we've instituted back in April of last year, um, any other corporation, states, territories, subdivisions, municipalities, co-ops, pro nonprofit, profit, limited dividend or mutual associations that provide or propose to provide eligible purposes under REST, which would include energy efficiency, renewables, storage, energy conservation measures, and those related services uh, and improvements and financing or relending. Green banks, for instance, would be eligible. Next slide, please. So this is a program evolution. And uh, John Michael, you said 2010. I, I actually go back to 2014 in the Farm Bill and then move through appropriations bills and the regulation uh, up till now. And most recently in uh, December of 2020, we actually put out a NOSA, which is a notice of uh, solicitation of applications um, for, uh, for RESP for FY 2021. Next slide, please. We had some adjustments and amendments from the 2018 Farm Bill, and frankly, the, the most important of this um, is the allowance for qualified consumer repayment of RESP to RESP borrowers on a recurring service bill that used to say recurring electric bill. So we've expanded this, which expanded the eligibility to, uh, to RESP quite a bit. Next slide, please. Um, in 2021, and this is the Appropriations Act, and it includes it, it, it says um, that we may allow eligible entities or comparable entities that provide energy efficiency services using their own billing mechanism or, or one that's contracted out to offer loans to consumers in any part of their ser service territory, which is another uh, deal where if you've got um, a, a service territory, for instance, Rurality is 50,000 or less for RESP, uh, which has at least one area of 50,000 or less. You can provide service to the entire service territory. Uh, we'll talk about budget authority in a minute. Next slide, please. Yeah, budget authority is, is quite a confusing issue if you're not familiar with the federal government. Um, 11 million in budget authority equates to um, quite a bit more in, in the ability to actually loan funds. Um, here, I listed in December of 2020, we had greater than $100 million available for RISP. In fact, uh, I checked that number last week, and it's more in the line of $240 million. So some of which has already been allocated, but because we're halfway through the year, um, but we still have quite a bit of funding available for 2021. Next slide, please. So here's a little bit of a synopsis as to what happened in fiscal year 2020, which ended uh, September 30th of last year. We received 17 letters of intent uh, for approximately $146 million. We were able to <clears throat> invite 12 applicants uh, to proceed with a loan application. Frankly, we ran out of money. Um, the average loan request is now approximately $8 million. That's a request. Uh, Non-traditional RUS borrowers for the first time were showing interest in the program. 
And only two of those 17 were actually existing borrowers. New applicant types included a couple of green banks, state energy offices, uh, municipalities, other utilities, gas and water, which all, as long as they're providing some form of energy efficiency would be considered eligible under the REST program and also state sponsored energy efficiency nonprofit entities. So next slide, please. Here's a, a, a map of the United States showing participating states. The darker of the colors, the more loans we actually have outstanding in those states. Next slide, please. So here's a program profile. As of 2020, we have 29 approved loans. A couple more now with, uh, uh, that have been approved here in 2021. Uh, approved loan sizes range from 150,000 to 50 million. There is no low and there is no high number for RESP. Uh, obviously, we're limited by the amount of budget we have available, but as you can see, there's quite a, quite a range. The approved loan size is 6.3 million. So We've had requests for eight, uh, we're, we're on, on a loan size of about 6.3. And that's because some of the early loans were uh, much smaller than they are today. We have uh, significantly uh, incre increased our renewable energy element. Uh, we're seeing more and more that really wanna do rooftop solar and community solar and things like that. And we do now have one uh, loan that is specifically targeted toward the manufactured home replacement uh, effort, which is actually not in, in the, the statute, it's in the appropriations bills and has been for the last three years. Next slide, please. So John Michael talked about this. This is uh, a little bit of information on the program profile. As you can see from the upper uh, yellow line, and these colors are pretty much the same, but uh, we've gone from in 2017, about $24 million worth of loans dropped a little bit in 18, uh, went up to 34 in 19, and last year we loaned out, uh, obligated $104 million. And, and we're hoping to do a little better this year, quite a bit better actually. And you can see the average loan size is the lower line from three to five to almost six, and now up to um, almost about nine and a half. And I know these numbers look like they're changing a little bit. It's because um, this is obligation as opposed to the actual contracts. Uh, next slide, please. This is a snapshot of the RESP application process. This is another one of those 10 minute slides, but for all intents and purposes, the loan application is for RESP is a two-part process. Uh, we follow a letter of intent, which is a five-page uh, document that you submit um, just to basically let us know what you are, who you are, uh, give us a little bit of information about you and what you believe, um, or, or how you feel you'll fit into the, in, into the REST portfolio. Um, it's, a, it's a sample that we send out. You basically fill in the blanks, send it in with some financial information, we review it, determine whether you're, you, you meet basic eligibility. If so, we'll invite you to proceed, apply for a complete application, and then we move along with the approval process based on the five C's of credit. Next slide, please. So here are some of the eligible activities or what we call energy efficiency measures for REST. There's 15 here. Uh, the most important one is number 15 to me, which is the other approved activities and investments that are directly related to energy efficiency implementation, which means all of the first 14, which would include weatherization, uh, farm type activities, uh, energy audits, um, the uh, renewable storage, et cetera, um, are, are really important, but we're also willing to be adaptable. Um, and we'll talk about that in the next slide, please. So some of these new eligible activities include uh, vehicle chargers and not just automotive, but construction vehicles. Um, if, uh, if you've got municipal electric vehicles, for instance, those would also be eligible for uh, under rest as long as it's behind the meter. So in other words, somebody has got to pay for it, uh, but, but it is eligible. Smart devices, John Michael addressed that as well. You know, thermostats, appliances, we will even include in, in, in very specific instances um, the, uh, the, the connection to a, to a broadband. Uh, if, 
if it can be demonstrated that it's it, it has some energy efficiency purpose, um, cost effective on or off grid renewable energy, and we talked about the manufactured homes. Next slide, please. Measurement and verification is part of the requirement under the statute. Uh, so I just wanted to make sure that that you all understood that um, we do need to demonstrate one of the few the, the the requirements of the of the statute is in the program is that we do verify that in fact whatever is uh, is whatever loan funds are are allocated are for some form of energy efficiency purpose or cost of avoidance um, when you're dealing with um, uh, with storage and and uh, generation. Uh, most important thing here is to to uh, evaluate balance uh, the uncertainty with the cost. Next slide. So here's some successful uh, examples of successful RESP applications. And we'll talk about um, the first one is uh, is actually a a borrower in Northern Ohio. Uh, it's one of the first RESP loans that we we allocated, and it's to commercial only but small commercial customers to implement energy efficiency improvements. Uh, so this particular borrower does work with a partner for loan processing, et cetera, all the financial side. Um, the loan terms are not to exceed 10 years, which is under RESP. Um, in this case, it was a 3% fixed rate. Um, so the, the farm bill actually increased that number from three to five, uh, but in this case, it was a pre-farm bill loan. They do require 25% equity uh, in, in the, the their relend or their borrower, um, and they do also require a minimum of 15% energy savings. Typically, for commercials, we're seeing in the 30% range. So, so that's pretty generous. Next slide, please. This is uh, John Michaels, one of one of his favorites, I believe. Um, it's an on-bill tariff financing. It's a co-op in Arkansas. Um, it, the the program is optional and voluntary for the electric co-ops members, and it is available to anybody that basically ties a meter into their system, um, and even to uh, to tenants uh, with the uh, approval of the of, of the building owner. Um, they do do a cost effectiveness analysis, kind of an energy audit, and identify recommended energy efficiency measures to improve energy efficiency to the member they can be it can be any number of things typically it's it's weatherization in this case um, but the important piece here is it is a tariffed model where the electric co-op actually recovers the cost of the investments through a monthly charge it's assigned to the meter or the or the the, the dwelling um, it, if the if the occupant leaves owner or tenant uh, future occupants are responsible for paying the upgrades until that cost is actually recovered. And the charge um, is considered uh, an essential part of the consumer's bill for electric service. And they treat it as such. They they have, to my knowledge, over the past two or three years that they've been running this program, they've had one, uh, get that one, uh, 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 it's not a default really, but one person that hasn't continued to pay. Next slide, please. So here's another one that um, is a residential energy efficiency program. This is implemented by a nonprofit on behalf of several participating electric co-ops. This is down in South Carolina. Um, loan size is approximately 10%. This was an early loan at 3% as well. And um, uh, homeowners and renters can use this with consent of the landlord. Um, this is on bill charges as is required by RESP, but this is not a tariff model. Um, there are a significant number of manufactured housing units within the service territory uh, that do participate. Uh, and and co-ops here, they actually get a lot of their marketing done by high bill complaints. So they go out, they took a look, take a look at it, make a recommendation to the homeowner, and, and um, they, they bring in a, a contractor to actually do the work. Next slide, please. Hey Bob, I don't certainly don't want to uh, rush you too much. Do want to note that the slides will definitely be available um, that we're going to send around the next few days, along with uh, with this webinar. And and um, if you could uh, wrap up in just a minute, so we could. Uh, we'll do. Thank you. Next slide. And 
Okay, so I wanted to get uh, a couple of the success stories. This is Umatilla out in Washington, or in, in Oregon. Um, in the first 10 years that they ran programs, they had 23 loans at 5% interest. With RESP, since then, they've made 70 loans at 2%. Uh, they've loaned about half a million dollars at this point. Uh, to date, they have had no member loan defaults since they began RESP, which is fairly significant. Next slide, please. Um, this is a success story, so you can you can read it. But long story short, it's it's pretty popular. Next slide. Um, this is back across the country, PD in in North Carolina. Uh, one of our first loans. Um, many of these were the direct result of marketing from the program to their members. Next slide. And this is a, a software program that PD uses. I wanted to show you two slides uh, on this just to give you some ideas to how how this actually works. Okay, so this is all kinds of data. This is a manufactured home that had an HVAC replacement. And if you see in the upper right-hand corner, the improvement is 35% on, on uh, the actual cost of energy. Next slide, please. So that one, the HVAC cost about 8,500 bucks. This here is similar situation, manufactured home. In this case, it was simply the repair of the metal duct work underneath the manufactured home at about $1,500 to $2,000 worth of work and an improvement of 38%. That is just significant for somebody that's living in the poverty line. Next slide, please. So I wanna to talk to you a little bit about the KW savings model that we talked about just a minute ago. Um, and, and important takeaways from this one are that once improvements are done, um, the Help My House project determined that those savings in the 30% range, as I talked about before, had very little degradation in that savings over time. The other piece to this that I think is important is the fourth bullet, which basically says if they actually got, say, a quarter of a million uh, folks across the state of South Carolina to sign up for this, they can actually do a cost avoidance on an entire uh, generation unit. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is a duck curve. If anybody's ever heard uh, it, I guess some people think this looks like a duck, but this is a load shape for an individual house in South Carolina. This is pre-project. This is what it looks like. Starting at uh, midnight uh, on the x-axis and ending at midnight on uh, all the way to the other end of the x-axis to the right. And the, the vertical, um, Axis uh, shows energy usage in kilowatt hours. So this is this is summer. Um, it's not really uh, drawing too much energy very very early in the morning. And when people are home, it's drawing quite a bit. Next slide, please. Okay, this is after the project was implemented. HVAC replacement. Uh, you can see that the uh, the duck has gotten a little bit lighter. He's gonna, he's been on a diet, and it saved quite a bit of money over the 24 hour period. So next slide, please. So these are uh, contact points for us within the USDA, and I will turn this back over to Doug. You're on mute, Doug. Uh, thanks so much. I apologize for, for nudging a lot. The fantastic uh, information and great examples at the end, and uh, love that duck. Um, that, that tells the story. I do wanna uh, go right to, um, Adora uh, if, if Abe, uh, who's the senior manager for research and development at NRECA and who leads the organization's Advancing Energy Access for All initiative. So Adora, thanks for being with us today. Thank you very much, Doug, and thanks uh, for inviting me. I really appreciate the opportunity. So I'm here really to talk to you know everyone about more opportunities, NRECA's efforts working with their co-ops to expand clean energy opportunities in rural America. So uh, uh, I know Doug earlier gave you a little bit of history about how rural electric cooperatives came to be, but to let you know who NRCA is, we're the Trade Association for Rural Electric Cooperatives. We have about 900 cooperatives, 834 distribution cooperatives, and about 63 generation and transmission cooperatives. We're in 48 states. We serve 56% of the nation's land mass and serving 42 million people. We own and maintain 42% of US electric 
distribution lines. So the project I'll be talking to you about today is called the Achieving Cooperative Community Equitable Solar Sources, is ACCESS for short. It's a Department of Energy, Solar Energy Technologies Office funded three-year project. The mandate for this project is for us to research how to make solar energy affordable for communities with fewer financial resources, extend the benefits of solar development to the low and moderate income consumers, and explore how we can use innovative, cost-effective energy access programs to serve co-ops uh, consumer members in need. At the end of the project, the resources and tools that we, um, information we get from this project can certainly, should certainly be used by all co-ops as well as other small utilities nationwide. So uh, earlier on, John Michael mentioned energy burden and part of the what the project, this access project is hoping to do, of course, is to look at ways that we can work with our co-ops to decrease energy burden on low-income members while also increasing benefits to the grid and opening opportunities for economic growth through the projects that our solar co uh, rural electric cooperatives are doing. A key component of this effort is to extend beyond initiatives that currently exist and look at new financial models or program designs, which will be tested by the co-ops working with us. How can you design your uh, solar, community solar or any kind of solar project to benefit, extend the benefits to low income consumers so they can participate? How can you possibly finance your project in a way that, again, the benefits continue to be extended to these communities that are at risk of, of, of uh, being left behind? So uh, the reason we really that NRCA and my team went after this project relates to a larger initiative that Doug mentioned that I lead at NRCA is the Advancing Energy Access for All initiative. I can imagine that you're familiar with some of the challenges that have emerged as the US and the global economies continue to evolve and the electric industry certainly is undergoing a transformation driven by technology. Income inequality, for example, income inequality in America has worsened over the past three decades. There's disparities between urban and rural areas. Those have increased significantly since rural electrification started. And I'm not, I don't know if you're aware of what is called persistent poverty areas in the United States. Cooperatives serve 92% of these persistent poverty counties. These are areas that have seen significant rates of poverty over time, at least 20% or more over time. They're identified by the US Treasury and rural electric cooperatives serve about 364 counties out of those counties in the United States. So that is a, it's a you know, it's really, it's a big, I guess I would say issue here and that's who we serve. There's also barriers to adoption of renewables. Utility industry continues to deploy renewable resources. Some segments of the consumer population, especially in rural America, are at a risk of being left behind. And of course, energy affordability still remains a key challenge. John Michael mentioned it earlier, the percentage of disposable household income that goes to pay a family's energy bills dispro disproportionately affects people in rural areas. You know, in some US counties, you have low-income households that face an energy burden that is six or seven times higher the moderate or affluent households. So uh, the NRC is an advancing energy access for all, the overarching initiative that this access solar project fits in, really is an initiative for us to create a sustainable practice around supporting our co-ops as they holistically serve their members, especially those who struggle to pay their bills and other families in need. One of the key objective that led us to so going after the DOE CEDO funded project is looking for a way to identify and build partnerships to advance solution for our members. Those partnerships could of course be working with uh, various stakeholders in the industries, advisors that we, we convened on our project. And ESI is actually one of the stakeholder advisors on my access project. I've been working with uh, Miguel Yanez, who's really been very supportive on this project. We, they collaborate with uh, various um, federal government agencies, going after federal government grants, national labs, universities. So working together, looking for ways to identify partnerships that can help us on uh, research project for that benefit our members. So the Access Project is the flagship project of this initiative. So just to be clear, the initiative really is not necessarily focused only on renewable energy. It's a way to you know clean energy as a whole, 
energy efficiency, looking at holistically at ways that co-ops work to improve their communities and the lives of the members through energy, environmental concerns, health and safety upgrades, energy efficiency, beneficial electrification, and things like that. So for this access project, we're working with a handful of cooperatives, about six of them scattered around the United States. We have Wachita Electric in Arkansas. We have Roanoke Electric in North Carolina, Anza Electric in California, um, Oklahoma Electric in Oklahoma. We have, um, I think I'm maybe, uh, Orcas Power Line in Washington State. John Michael also mentioned them earlier. They're one of the key um, uh, co-ops leading this initiative with us. So what we're doing with them, they all have ideas and projects on the ground to, in, to increase access to solar to their low moderate income consumers. So what we're working with them is to find out how can we convene a group of you know, stakeholders, advisors, technical expertise and guide them on the, in the path of this project, looking at how they are designing their project, what are the financing up changes that could be made, is there anything differently that if you do your project in this way versus what you've done before, essentially, that could make that would help increase the number of low income, low moderate income households that are able to participate and receive the benefits. At the end of this three year project, we hope whatever research information we gather from this project will continue to be shared with the, uh, the co op community and industry, as well as DOE, with the intent that some of these projects. Uh, the research findings will be scaled, can be scaled beyond, you know, the let's say the pilot programs that start that start uh, started this effort. So that way, you know, the projects continue to to uh, hopefully be scaled and proliferate. So some of the project, I would say, the uh, programs that we hope to test or the the program uh, designs that could be tested in this uh, throughout with the access project is. Integration of new technologies, for example, including measures of storage for increased technical and financial health, special rate programs. How can we explore offers that encourage members and subscribers to shift their load to coincide with solar generation? Uh, LMI Community Solo, you know, looking at strategies as you know, voluntary cross-subsidization for low-income members by other customer segments in a case where maybe certain individual members could possibly say we'll sponsor solar subscriptions for low moderate income households. How can we use the pay as you save model or on bill financing to uh, see how you can adapt that benefit that usually happens on energy efficiency using that for solar? Is that possible? Uh, behind the meter services, how you explore the offering such a rooftop solar that could certainly, that low income households could participate in. And finally, maybe hybridization of energy efficiency and solar programs, in, including potentially seeing how you can leverage existing federal assistance programs in such a way that you can expand offerings to by bundling solar and energy efficiency together. For financial mechanisms that we're exploring, usually our co-ops, of course, you know, power purchase agreements, working with established entities such as CoBank and CFC, is there opportunity to work with CDFIs? Is there opportunity for catalytic uh, financing such as through philanthropy? What could those things do? Is there an opportunity to uh, look at uh, opportunity zone incentives? Is there, what are the pros and cons? So general, these are just the examples of what we hope to look at and of course, see how this, the, all of this can be used to expand the benefits of solar energy to low moderate income households. So I'll stop right here and see if there are any questions and uh, I can certainly share anything that we found out so far well adora thank you so much that um uh you um i think you you kind of forecast the question i had and that that list of of possibilities it really makes the mind kind of real uh in terms of of um you know some strategies that will really make a difference for people in rural america um you know using some of the infrastructure and systems that we already have and and just being smarter with those, but then building perhaps some new ones in the future. I'm just going to ask with the, the, we had a few questions come in. I'm, I'm going to kind of uh, merge a couple of those and I'm going to ask it and, and for the panel, if, if folks uh, go ahead and turn your cameras on uh, and we will, we got about five minutes left here and we want to keep it to time, but I'm, I'm just going to go and it's a, it's a bit of a kind of a general question, but obviously, uh, it's a very active time uh, policy-wise 
uh, on the Hill, you know, we see some some um, proposals from the administration, and I'm I'm not going to ask anybody to um, you know to to state a formal uh, position here necessarily, but just you know what what we, we do have a number of people on um, on the webinar today who who work uh, who are policymakers and work for policymakers. It, it's you know what are some of the key trends that you see in, you know through your windshield that policymakers should be thinking about oh wait this this is an area that we should be looking at in terms of uh, perhaps you know policy levers that can really make a difference um and um and you know if there's uh, you know, of course we're in we're we're in the context of the the infrastructure the early end of an infrastructure conversation right now so that's part of it but that's not all of it so i'll just leave it there and um I'll see if anybody, it's a bit of a jump ball, but uh, just to be mean to John Michael, I might ask him to go first. I'm honored by your meanness. Um, <laughs> uh, I, you know, I think a, a point that I hope everyone gets uh, takes away today is that there's a lot of really good stories out in rural America. Uh, there's a lot of things happening, both kind of at the and at like the laboratory stage, but then just just good work that's happening in you know what can be a challenging environment. It, it's, it can be hard for contractors to get to where you need to go. Uh, Opalco uh, or Orcas Power Light we mentioned, it's across 20 island chains with no bridges. It's all ferry connected, and they're and they're still making it work. So um, you know I think I think in light of the fact that there are all these these great ideas that still need to be lifted up because they they can very easily fly under the radar. I suppose some you know things happening in, in urban areas sometimes um, is that you know more money for RESP as these ideas get out there uh, and and replicated and and more money to serve as like new you know experiments with programs will be great. So I mean you said you talked about formal positions, uh, ESI, NCBA, and NRECA are on a letter that went to the Hill yesterday asking for an increase, uh, more than doubling of appropriation for RESP in this new cycle, up to 25 million, which would unlock. Uh, a lot more than that, uh, the way yeah. it is with the way the program works. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, John Michael. Um, Dora or or Bob. Sure, uh, I can go. I mean, I'll concur with John Michael. Is really looking for opportunities to continue to tell our story. And good, my colleague Billy is on the line. Uh, I see her there. So she works with our you know government relations team, and she can certainly add any any policy positions. But really, my role here is on what I'm working with the co-ops is. We want to continue to tell our stories and there's so many good things you know as you can see happening in co-op world you see who we serve 92 percent persistent poverty counties co-ops are doing what they are doing to continue to serve their communities and if we want case studies for whatever issue it is I, I, you know in in light of what we've presented we can certainly find it we all work together we work with John Michael and Opalco, and we can continue to do that. We have formed those uh, relationships. And Billy, if you want to add anything about policy, please go ahead. Yeah, happy to. Hi there, Billy Kamaya I'm with uh, NRECA as well. Um, so the President's Americans Jobs Plan um, certainly included a lot of funding opportunities for energy efficiency. I think the trend that we've been seeing in policy um, actually follows uh, Bob's uh, slide on how RESP has been expanded. We're seeing a lot of attention towards electrification, whether that includes electric vehicles. We're seeing um, a trend towards adding some of these other categories to existing programs. So in addition to electrification, I'd say energy storage, um, adding more renewable options. Um, one of the things that we have talked to some members of Congress about, um, there's this notion of uh, we want to make sure that we're getting underserved communities access to all of these programs. Mm -hmm. um, and so we do try to do a little education to say, first step is weatherization, then energy efficiency, then we can start looking at uh, adding renewables. Um, and so uh, there certainly is this trend to add all these new technologies that weren't traditionally considered energy efficiency, but save energy, reduce emissions. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Billy. That's a great point. Thanks, and thanks for joining us today, Billy. Mm -hmm. uh, Bob, do you have have any comments here? Well, only to thank those members of Congress for letting us run this program. It's uh, it's extremely satisfying to get uh, in feedback, really, from uh, from the co-ops and from qualified consumers uh, to see that the program's actually uh, actually useful. I mean, that that certainly makes our day. Um, 
much brighter uh, than uh, you know th than not. Um, and it's it's wonderful to work with the co-ops. Uh, Opaco's a great one. Umatilla, they're all excellent. Uh, th those that have borrowed from us. Uh, we have a great working relationship with them. We have a good one with the NRECA as well, um, and 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 certainly with uh, with folks like uh, John Michael and and Doug, in in the process of uh, of this whole energy efficiency for rural America. So thanks, Bob. Thanks for that. And I'll I'll just finish up. We we are at time. Um, I'll mention we'll be sending this out. Those who had uh, powerpoints will will be included in that. You know, I, I I will bring this a little bit back to to the cooperative business model. Um, I think we brought you some examples here today that when uh, you know one is is trying to deliver uh, some type of strategy that um, that's really going to make a difference for people uh, in their in their families uh, in their businesses. Uh, looking at that cooperative business model, you know, particularly the one that already exists and is built out in in most of rural America with rural electric cooperatives. Uh, and then other ways of, of using cooperatives, I think, is a uh, is just a key strategy. You know, both because the system's there, and you can there the, the, you can um, move a, a program through there. But also, there is that better feedback loop of of you know the voice from the ground. Um, you you get a better program because uh, co-ops tend to have um, you know better representation. It's in it's in their nature. So. Uh, I'll leave it with that and just again say thank you to all. I'll I'll uh, be so bold and to volunteer all the the associations here that if there's any questions, I'm I'm certain that uh, all the associations here would would love to have a conversation with uh, with you in whatever office you're representing today. And uh, I hope everybody is safe and be well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Good.